Hello everyone, welcome to the History Made Awesome podcast. My name is Eric, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Dan. Hi. Uh, our next guest is a person that had the, opp- had the amazing opportunity to work with and study under for the last two years. For grad school, my advisor, Dr. Sasha Pack, professor of history and director of graduate studies for the Department of History at the University of Buffalo. Hello, Professor Pack, and welcome to the program. Well, hello, Eric and Dan. It's good to be here. Very cool. Uh, now, uh, tell everyone, you know, what do you study, you know, where do you get your degrees, and what classes do you teach? Sure. Um, I, uh, I'm a professor of history, as you said, at the University of Buff- uh, Buffalo, the State University of New York. Um, uh, my area of specialization within the discipline of history is in modern Spain, which is to say Spain since about 1750 or so, um, more specifically 1850 to 2000. Um, However, I will teach classes uh, in a range of topics on Spain and Portugal throughout history, um, the Second World War, uh, European history in the 19th and 20th centuries, histories of globalization, histories of travel and tourism, histories of fascism and authoritarianism, um, which tends to be one of my most popular classes. Um, so uh, the history of the world uh, between the two world wars is another one that, um, that I like to do. So I, I have a pretty wide range, I guess, um, in, uh, even though my, my research specialty is modern Spain. Oh, and then you asked me about my degrees and that kind of thing. Well, I completed my PhD in 2004 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, which at the time had one of the, the great um, historians of modern Spain um, in really anywhere, uh, a man named Stanley Payne, who uh, is still with us, but he's retired now. Um, and he uh, was my PhD advisor. And that was an amazing opportunity uh, to work with him and to get to know, to get to know him. Yeah, and we'll get definitely get a chance to look at, you know, how did you kind of get into history and then also kind of what, uh, like, what was your experience kind of going through the ranks and doing all that good stuff, too. But uh, sure. before, before I get to uh, talking about your book, your 2019 book that you recently produced, The Deepest Border, I kind of want to give people a little bit of insight into how we know each other. Um, so a uh, couple of things. So first, actually, um, you are good friends with Professor uh, Harris, who we just had on the podcast two episodes ago. Um, and so she was the one who kind of told me about you. And also uh, Pamela Radcliffe was another person who told me that I should uh, come and uh, work under you. And I was, I'm very happy for making that choice to coming out to Buffalo and uh, make, you know, making me feel, you know, welcome there and everything like that. Everyone else, everyone else faculty, but especially you, Professor Her- uh, Pack, uh, for doing that as well. Um, well, I only wish you could have stayed the whole time and didn't get kicked <laughs> out because of, the, uh, because of the epidemic. Oh yeah, and so actually, I have I have I have um, it, interesting story that happened there because we were both uh, in um, what's it called? Um, I was your uh, TA for the Second World War, um, and that was a really fun time. And so I was kind of interested, in, like, what was your kind of perception and kind of what was your take when the pandemic was happening? Because for me, I think I was like I had like a rhythm kind of going. It's like do do my schoolwork, then teach schoolwork, then teach. You know, kind of get a rhythm going. But then all of a sudden you kind of have like the pandemic coming in and if kind of my recollection, just kind of reading the news and kind of seeing it coming, I'm like, at uh, first, I think it was like in February, like a couple weeks before, like the pandemic hit, like I found out that it was actually hit Sacramento, like my hometown. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. And you've seen more of these kind of spots going. Um, and then from my perception, I didn't really kind of see anything going wrong until I until I was in like a uh, professor uh, Nathan's class, I was taking his class on myth history. And he was telling us that from their point of view that like, it was like a week or like the, the week of us getting like school reverted to and uh, uh, online essentially, that they may be looking to, to do that. And so that was kind of my early warning of kind of like, oh, something's gonna change, something's gonna like happen right now. And then it finally happened like, oh, wow, it actually happened. So what was your kind of like, from your take on what was going on? like? Were you like, when it happened, when it, were you freaking out or you like, how was your perception on that? I'm- I was, well, this was March, uh, of course, March, 2020. Um, and I, you know, had read that some of the colleges, I was sort of more thinking of the East Coast, because of course we're, we're in the sort of the hinterland of the East Coast here in Buffalo. Well, I'm not in Buffalo right now, but 
Um, but that's where, you know, that's sort of what you, that's sort of your reference. Um, I, I want to say that maybe Columbia and Princeton, a couple other colleges, uh, uh, private colleges on the East Coast had gone completely remote already by early March, but it was sort of a precautionary measure more than anything. Um, but most places were still open and we were still open and, and it wasn't really clear. It, it was clear that uh, you know, New York was bracing for something. Um, I remember sort of being fairly blasé about it until I heard an interview uh, with a doctor in Northern Italy in Bergamo uh, that was just heart wrenching about, you, you know, he was a, a, a physician who, you know, um, he, he wasn't a respiratory. I can't remember what his specialty was. He was like a dermatologist or something and nothing particularly to do with what COVID attacks but they were just so desperate for anyone with medical training to be on the floor staffing the hospitals. And he described what he saw, which, you know, I don't need to get into, but the waiting rooms where people were just dying uh, while they were waiting for care. And it was just, and then I thought that's heading for New York. It's going to be heading for Buffalo soon. However, at the same time, I'm not um, somebody who finds panicking constructive. Um, the university had its rules. We had uh, a final ex a midterm exam scheduled for the month for the Friday before spring break. Uh, and they announced that we would have classes through that Friday and then just wouldn't return after spring break. And I thought, well, that's reasonable. We'll have our final exam. Um, and what I really hadn't quite internalized, I think, was that the kids from downstate, because of course we're the State University of New York and there's something like a third of our students come from New York City metropolitan area. And they were really panicking. They were panicking because they didn't know if they'd be able to get home. They were worried that there was gonna be a kind of, um, you know, a cordon sanitaire uh, that was gonna be put up somewhere in the Catskills um, that would have prevented people from driving in or out of the New York area. And so, um, so they, you know, they wanted to get out. And I, I, I just hadn't quite, you know, from being from Buffalo, I was just sort of thinking, well, we've got a couple of weeks, so we'll just go ahead and do this. But I hadn't quite, you know, so what we wound up doing on the fly, as you might, might recall, was kind of making it optional. Um, do you want to do, I said, look, take it in person if you can, but if you can't, if you need to go home, that's your priority. And then we'll figure out later how you'll make that up. This was really, literally like 48 hours before the exam. And then, of course, I'm deluged with emails of people who have nothing to do, nothing particularly to worry about, who aren't from New York City, who are just, you know, from just, just uh, you know, uh, from Western New York or wherever, uh, who just want to sort of know which is going to be the easier assignment. Yeah. You know, is, are they going to get a better grade? And that's all they're caring. They, they cared about. And I said, look, you know, um, I, I don't like to play toward the grades. I understand grades matter and you have to give grades because it is the best motivator for students to do well. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, in a time like this, don't worry too much about which is the easier one. You know, if you studied and you can make it to campus, come take you know, <clears throat> test. So anyway, that was kind of my thinking about it. I, um, you know, and throughout uh, this whole thing, I've just tried to keep a level head about it. Um, I've spent a lot of time actually studying um, disease and history. Uh, it's something I've written a little bit about, but I've mostly just kind of read about because I find it fascinating, particularly cholera in the 19th century is one, um, just because it's an area that I've done more research in, but just, you know, the, the, um, the bubonic plague, smallpox, um, tuberculosis is a, a malaria. These are all epidemics that, and, and then of course, the more recent ones like HIV AIDS, um, they have fascinating histories and they do one thing um, that they seem to share in common is that the panic level um, at the beginning is always very high. Um, and a lot of myths circulate about how the disease can be transmitted, which tend to be exaggerated, which is normal. I mean, obviously, you know, when there's a lot of unknowns, you don't take chances and you say, but I sort of had a feeling that, you know, some of this stuff about like, if you touch a surface that, you know, two weeks later, somebody else touches it, they're not going to be contaminated. 
um, you had the same thing. I recall when I was a kid with HIV AIDS, like there was, you know, there was this sense like, you know, don't, we were always told, you know, don't, um, well, actually the part I remember, cause I was just young enough that the part I remember was when the myths were being dispelled, like it's okay to use a public toilet, you know, it's okay to, you know, you won't get AIDS from it, but that's because all these myths had been out there. Um, and, and, and if you go back, you know, further in history, you know, same sort of things. And of course, when you get back into the late middle ages, they tend to be kind of, um, they kind of tend to be infused with all kinds of religious beliefs and, and things like that. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. I mean, it was for myself, it was pretty crazy. Cause of like, you know, I had to like pack all my things. I think it was like on the day of that, that midterm that we had to do after I proctored it. Like I basically had to go home and start just packing everything I can in my apartment to get ready to get shipped. And so then I had to get on a flight. It was like pretty crazy trying to get yeah. back home. Like yeah. uh, it was crazy. Cause I think when I got to Arizona, I think like the flight was like late or whatever, like it was getting really late. So people were thinking like, Oh, it's like the last, it was like, was this the last flight to Sacramento or whatever? Like, right. Like, you, you, were, like, <laughs> fighting you were wondering if you were going to be living in Arizona for the next, <laughs> for, the, <laughs> yeah. for the next 16 months <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the Phoenix airport. Yeah. 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 So uh, it was, a, but uh, we got home and, you know, I got all my stuff later and, you know, now we're here and everything's good. And so, you know, knock on wood, that continues, I guess. Well, things to be seem to be doing better. Yeah. And so um, and you're also in Paris right now, right? That's what you're doing. That's right. That's that's what this beautiful background here behind me is. It's Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, it's a wall in a Paris apartment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's brilliant. Um, so, uh, Dan, if you don't if you think we're ready to go, uh, we should go. Right. Yeah, sure. I have one anecdote, I suppose, with the, uh, the myths about how disease spread. There was a particular one I found very interesting at the very beginning of this pandemic, where they thought COVID can only infect you if it goes into your eyes, which is obviously nonsensical, but several prominent news outlets said it was facts, and I just, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, I remember that one, too. Yeah, the, the, the thing with the eyes and people wondering, should we all go around wearing goggles or, you know, um, <laughs> But uh, it, the fact, you know, people don't know and, and what's reported as, as fact. And of course, it was at a time when, you know, you have um, already a lot of skepticism about news outlets and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and there's a certain amount. I mean, it's warranted to some extent. Um, yeah. But um, but that uh, but of course, that um, has become so politicized now that, um, you know, don't need to go into that but that's that was like another <laughs> element of this that was so interesting yeah definitely definitely um so let's uh let's get into your book uh professor back so um this is your 2019 book the deepest border the streets of gibraltar and the making of modern hispano african borderland so i think what we're going to do is we're going to kind of talk about this book in terms of kind of like uh certain themes about it and kind of the general idea and how it kind of relates to kind of the making of history to kind of explain it to kind of everyday people, but also maybe to, uh, you know, specific things that you felt were important that you wanted to kind of add to um, academia and stuff like that and in the ways that they look at history as well. Um, so I kind of want to start off with your know, page six. Um, I think page six, uh, I have a quote on here that I think kind of highlights uh, certain elements. I think covers a lot of what you're trying to do in this book. So um so basically, this book takes place in Gibraltar, which is kind of the southern tip of Spain. But in this book, you kind of other touches, touch it like other places around it, like Morocco and um, Algiers or parts of Algiers and kind of like what's the, the conversation is going on there. So I'll just kind of read this point. Um, so you say that the central process described in this book is not so much the expansion of a colonial frontier, but the development of a multilateral regional order in the Hispano African borderland over a long period historical period. As often as not, the main role of the slipstream potnets and other powerful local networks in this uh, narrative was to draw rival powers into cooperation in order to defeat them. So the way you can kind of, I'll kind of kind of say what I think about it, but also you can correct me on this. So when I look at this and that, that, that page in the book in general, is that this book is less of a history that focuses like on an idea of, let's say like imperialism or like a straight up national history. 
instead, I think it kind of shows how this space kind of generates certain perceptions on the development of kind of borders, natural histories in the case of like say Spain and Morocco, or even how 19th and early 20th century imperialism took many forms. Um, I don't know if you kind of uh, agree with me or you can kind of not, um, but can you kind of expand on this idea and what kind of brought you to write about this small but important area in the world? Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. I, 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 I always like to hear what, you know, people try to, um, you know, say in their own words what, what um, uh, you know, about my own writing, what they, what they get out of it. And I think that's, that's, that's well said, what you said. I think that's fair. Um, you, you know, um, there, I think, um, you know, there tends to be this kind of perception that Europe, expansionist Europe, uh, really from the, the, the high Middle Ages all the way down through World War II is just this expansionist juggernaut from the Crusades to, you know, the seaborne empires and the, the, the empire, you know, the, the colonial expansion in the Americas and then into Africa and, and, and Asia. Um, and it's just this, you know, juggernaut expanding outward. Um, and so therefore one looks at Spain and then Northern Morocco does become a kind of a Spanish colony that there's this assumption that, you know, um, that is part of this story of just relentless European expansionism. Mm -hmm. However, um, and well, indeed the Spaniards in, interpreted it that way as well. I mean, when, when they won a big battle in 1859, well, in 1860, um, over the Moroccan Sultan, uh, you know, it was greeted with cheers in Madrid and Barcelona. Like this was, you know, the second conquest of, you know, the conquest that was never fulfilled um, in 1492, uh, when, when, of course, at that point, the, the Christians kicked out the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula, but there was a lot of momentum to carry that forward into Africa. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, the, the Pope, uh, Alexander IV said, you know, keep going. Queen Isabella, uh, the famous, you know, Isabel the Catholic, uh, the, um, you know, Ferdinand and Isabel um, said, you know, her dying exhortation was, you must continue this, you know, um, pushing Christianity southward into Africa. So they never did because it was too hard. Uh, mm -hmm. There was too much resistance. Yeah. Um, and so they sort of contented themselves with, with just holding the peninsula. Uh, and so when they, the Spanish won in 1860, it became this sort of big nationalist moment where like, now we're like fulfilling the, um, you know, the un, unfulfilled, unredeemed uh, uh, wishes of Isabel the Catholic. And so, but that actually, I don't think is very true. Um, I think the Spanish um, uh, government, the Spanish foreign policy apparatus didn't really, the Spanish elite, um, they didn't, they had to be sort of drawn into Morocco because the feeling was that um, France and Britain were expanding in Africa and they were swallowing up gradually and they were going to converge right on Spain's southern border. And, um, and that would be trouble because a war between France and Britain we think of them as allies in the 20th century, but in the mid 19th century, they're very much imperial rivals. Uh, and a war between France and Britain could have been fought on Spanish territory, or at least if it were, if, if they sort of reached um, their friction point, let's say the two empires, you know, somehow clashed in Northern Morocco, it could, it was one sort of step away for the Spaniards to think, well, you know, the British are holding the Gibraltar, the French may seize one of the Balearic Islands uh, in the Western Mediterranean, and you could have, um, you know, them sort of um, drawing the Spanish into a conflict. And that was really the thing. And, and the only way to avoid that is to carve out our own space. And so I kind of look at it, it is colonialism, but it's sort of a defensive kind of colonialism that sort of comes from the kind of classical age of geopolitics when the term the term was vital space was the was the term that that becomes associated with this that you know every nation needs to control not just its own borders but its vital space that is like the sort of space around it because you need a kind of buffer of, of protection 
Um, and, you know, geopolitics still applies, but geopolitics is different today. Um, you can't just look at a map and figure out what every country's foreign policy is. But, you know, with the advent of um, high speed uh, shipping, especially naval vessels and uh, long range artillery and all these things that are coming in toward the end of the 19th century, these kind of ideas are and, and the ability to control territory in a way through rail um, you know, to, and through like just the administrative apparatus, um, these ideas of geopolitics just become very salient and the Spaniards are thinking, well, we need to control a part, you know, a part of Northern Morocco. So that's when they become involved. Um, they don't necessarily want to exploit it as like a, a, a colony of like agricultural settlement and things like that. They just wanted to have their army there um, and, to, and to make alliances with some of the Northern uh, tribes um, in the mountainous area of northern Morocco, just as, as a kind of defensive measure. That's, you know, that's, I think, my main argument, uh, really, uh, with regard to that. I mean, there's more to it, but I'd say that that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what you get is it's a kind of colonialism, but the idea and there's a whole ideology that develops with it that Spaniards, uh, although Spaniards are Catholics and Moroccans are Muslims, uh, and you have this age old religious conflict, there's this idea that it, in the end, they're people of the same race, mm -hmm. um, that they are, you know, that they lived together at one time uh, in, in, in medieval Iberia, that, you know, there's so much, you know, genetic, uh, you know, blood sharing, you know, shared bloodlines and so forth. In Morocco, you have I mean, names that you think are Spanish names, Vargas, Torres, these kinds of things have been Arabized and you, you'll you encounter a lot of um, Moroccan elites with names like, you know, Al Tares and Al Vargas, things like that, which are just Arabized versions of, of Hispanic names. And so there's a sense that they are, that they actually have maybe more in common than they are different, you know, they are different. They're, you know, they're skilled at guerrilla fighting. The Spaniards have always taken pride, as you know, Eric, um, yeah. in, in, their, in their ability to wage sort of this insurgency warfare and the Moroccans as well. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of come to be all these theories that, that actually that they are kind of of a feather and that their true enemies are in fact a common enemy, the British and the French. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was kind of the idea. So it's not this kind of just this imperial push where it's like the Europeans against everyone else. It's the Spaniards are much more ambivalent about this. Look, yeah. it's not to exaggerate. They also sort of oppress the Moroccans in the kind of colonial way as well, but it lives alongside this belief that they are actually sort of brothers. Oh uh, yeah, or cousins. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good literature on that point. The fact that they consider themselves um, both part of the same race. I forget the book that you sent me that I should that I read, but um, yeah, there's some good stuff there. And then, like, how did you kind of get to talking about this part of the world? Because I think a lot of people are like, it's just like one small piece, like what's so important about it. But I guess what it, what kind of got you to kind of like, oh, we need to, this needs to be written about. What Was it like a book you read or you went there or like what kind of gave you that idea to kind of write about this place? Um, you know, a number of things. I, I was looking around for, um, I, I've always been interested in, in human mobility and just people like crossing borders and things like that. And so I, I thought, well, this is a border and it turned out to be much more of a border than I realized because it's not just a single border. There's lots of borders around there. I'll get into that maybe later. Um, but, um, but also I think it was just to, to say that, you know, this is strategically a key area and has been for centuries for Spain and for the Sultanate of Morocco, now the Kingdom of Morocco. Um, and so I thought, what if you told the story from the perspective of this place and you kind of look at uh, how the Strait of Gibraltar has been a very important factor in determining the course of Spanish national history and indeed of Moroccan national history. Um, and, and that, I think that was kind of what drew me in was the idea of telling, telling the history of a, of a country or in this case of two countries from the perspective of the common border. Um, because, you know, Spain is a completely different country if it's not 
where it is, right? If it's <laughs> not, you know, if it's not on this border, which is not only the frontier with the Islamic world, but it's also a passageway between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, which great powers have been have have been fighting over yeah. for for centuries. Well, not so much these days, um, <laughs> because because we control it with the U.S. Um, sixth Fleet or is it Sixth Fleet or Fifth Fleet. I can't remember in in Rota uh, in the south of Spain, where we you know essentially the United States now controls the the Mediterranean or at least the Western Mediterranean, the passage through Gibraltar. But for centuries, you know, this was really an apple of discord. Um, and, uh, and when the British took control of it in 1714, they really took control of, you know, they, that means that if you just think strategically what it means, it means that France has an Atlantic fleet and a Mediterranean fleet that cannot, can never be joined together Mm -hmm. because, the British control that choke point. Uh, Same with Spain. They have an Atlantic fleet and a Mediterranean fleet that they cannot, without British approval, you know, unite to form like a a, a massive, uh, you know, a a massive Navy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those kinds of things, you know, they're sort of a part of a bigger um, strategic discussion, but they actually affect Spain because, because suddenly, um, because suddenly Spain has this British presence right in their midst, uh, which really, you know, constrains what they what they can do and um, and also creates opportunities for them if they're willing to go along with it. Yeah, British are everywhere, I guess. <laughs> they're, they're everybody's yeah. missed. Oh, they used to be. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're still in Gibraltar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can, oh, I can kind of break down this book um, a little bit. So um, I kind of see there's like three themes that I think kind of flow throughout the book. Um, I think one well, theme one is kind of borders are not like a thing that things that exist in nature, but like our historical process. I think another thing I think we just kind of touched on it is like a different perception of 19th and early 20th century imperialism. And it's kind of evolution with like the Second World War. And I think lastly is like the long time span that kind of your book covers and the multiple kind of characters and from multiple nationalities. And um, it's something that also is something important in your book that I see that we can talk about. So I kind of want to discuss this first thing, you know, the borders are not like a, are not natural, but are a like historical process kind of thing. That's one of the main stays in your book that I felt can kind of, people can kind of gravitate towards. So um, I think the one thing you kind of start off with, and I think you cover in different ways is kind of just the straight up British and Gibraltar kind of border itself. I think the one thing you kind of show is that like, for the most of the time when uh, the British took it over after the war of Spanish exception in the early 18th century, um, for a lot of time, there wasn't like a set wall or set border as we would consider, as we in Americans consider as a, as a border, kind of like with the southern border uh, with Mexico and the United States, which we'll try to talk about later in the podcast. But it was kind of like just like a like an arbitrary air, kind of like a disputed kind of middle zone that just each nation controlled. And for a lot of time, there was, I think you kind of discuss is that, um, you know, there was not like any set policies. It was kind of up to kind of the people who were at that space to, to say who can come in, who can not can come in. But as time goes into the 19th century and a lot more kind of discussions start to happen in that area, then both countries actually start to set up a, a border and actually set up, you know, these are our waters. You know, you can only come in when we come in from uh, whatever London or Madrid says. Um, so can, can you kind of talk about how that works, that idea works in your book? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, first, the first point about borders being, you know, um, historically constructed process there there are, i mean it's sort of, sort of weird but i think <laughs> i think ultimately you think of borders are actually a process yeah. um, they're not a, a place or a, a they're not a line on a map they're a they're a process that take place over history because you know you look at a map and you see well that's a pretty logical place to have a border the strait of gibraltar um but in fact you know before modern times you know, it's kind of approximative. It's pretty easy to go, you know, to sail across uh, or to get a boat across the Strait of Gibraltar from very early on. So, um, you know, if you've managed to conquer your way across North Africa, um, it's not actually a big jump to then, you know, jump to Iberia. Same thing with, with Europe. I mean, the Romans and I mean, the Visigoths, they, they, they always, you know, these empires always had presence on both, on both sides. Uh, of the strait. Um, it's only that moment I referred to 1492 when the, when the Catholic monarchs consolidate, you know, they expel the Muslims from the Iberian peninsula 
and um, they go, um, or at least they don't expel all Muslims, but they expel the Muslim leadership. Um, and, and so that, uh, that group consolidates in Morocco and that sort of for the first time becomes a political border. Um, and even after that, the Spanish continue to hold two um, possessions in Northern Morocco, the Ceuta and, and Melilla, um, which, which are not considered colonies, actually. They're considered to be provinces of, of Spain. So, um, or autonomous, autonomous communities to be precise. Um, but, you know, there's no predetermined, preordained geographical reason that this needs to be the case. Um, it's just um, kind of how things turned out. But, but over, over time, I mean, uh, you know, when the, that, that just kind of developed that way, but we can't, under, we can't think of borders as being, you know, permanent um, and being just defined by ge geographical features. Obviously, there's some cases where like countries have sort of natural borders of mountain ranges and so forth because they're easily defended. But the Strait of Gibraltar is not one of them. It's not an easily defended kind of border because, in fact, in fact, southern Spain was long for long quite vulnerable to raids. Um, I mean, that was the great fear uh, in the Middle Ages of every um, of every uh, Spanish Christian, uh, you know, would walk along the coastline of, um, of Mediterranean Spain was that there'd be a, a raid and he'd be plucked, um, you know, uh, plucked from the shore and sent off to a life of slavery. Uh, be, you know, sent to Baghdad and become a, or, or something like that. And, and, you know, work in a mine or, uh, or, 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 or uh, in the case of a woman work in a, in a harem or something like that. So, I mean, you know, that was, that, that's actually a vulnerable point. And it's one reason that would motivate the Spaniards to, to actually push beyond that. It's not a natural border by any means. Uh, again, I've kind of gone off and talked about something other than what you asked me um, about what was the next part of your question? Well, I guess to kind of go off of that. Um, I think when people think about borders, I think another thing is that like they think it's just there and that it's just a boundary and that's all it is. But I think also you go beyond that as, as right. well. Oh, right. right. So, uh, sorry. So you're talking about, yeah, Gibraltar, which is this big rock. It's like four, I mean, it's, you know, you can't miss it if you see it. It's a giant rock in the middle of, you know, kind of pr a protrusion off the, um, uh, off the southern tip of, of Spain, and it is connected. It's not an island. It is connected by this narrow strip of kind of muddy land, um, which has, you know, been reclaimed and built on. Now there's an airport there today. Um, incidentally, if you ever you can walk into Gibraltar from Spain, and you actually have to walk across the runway because it's the only place to build this runway. Uh, and you know, you look both ways when you cross the street. But I've never looked both ways you know, to make sure a plane wasn't landing. Yeah. Um, but that, that's what, that's what it is now. Um, uh, when, when a plane's landing, you know, there's a guard there that tells you you can't cross, but still, you still crazy. look. Crazy. Um, anyway, but that's the only place you can put an airport there. But, but, but this is a contested isthmus, you know, that's what this narrow strip of land is called an isthmus, of course. And, and, um, and people, uh, and, you know, the Spaniards sort of claimed, claimed that the isthmus belonged to them. The British sort of didn't really claim much, but they started burying their dead there because they didn't, they couldn't, you can't bury dead, the dead in a rock, you know, inside a So they, they started using it for that. And then they started using it. They didn't really have a, a place to grow crops in, you know, on this big rock. So they started, you know, kind of growing crops there and they would put their sewage there and, you know, their, their wastewater, they would kind of dump there. And then over time, they then they built a slaughterhouse there. And then the Spaniards started saying, hey, you know what? You're kind of using this, <laughs> this land a lot. And we really sort of think of it as ours. According to the treaty, you only control the fortress, not, you know, all this like extra land. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and then, but it was really not so much, but the Spaniards were willing to allow that because they weren't using the land for anything, really. You know, it's like your next door neighbor uses a little spot in your yard for something that you're not using. So you don't, you know, you get along fine. So you don't make a big fuss about it. So it wasn't about possession of territory. And this is a point that I, I want to drive home. Um, 
and one of the points I really want want the book to to make effectively is that um, border disputes don't tend to be about the actual control of the soil. Well, of course, in some cases, they very clearly are, like if there's oil, <laughs> for example, or some natural resource and countries will fight over it. But most of the time, they're about how to control the passage across <clears throat> across the border. So what starts happening is Spaniards uh, are, are smuggling tobacco, which is um, untaxed in Gibraltar, but heavily taxed in Spain. And so, you know, all these big shipments of tobacco are coming into Gibraltar from Virginia and the Carolinas, and then later from uh, India, and they're really cheap. And so these Spaniards are going, you know, running there and they're running across the border. And as long as the Sp there's no Spanish guardhouse to control that border, they're just selling, you know, at huge profits, they're selling this, this tobacco um, because it's not only better quality tobacco, but it's also cheaper than the stuff that the Spanish government, you know, monopoly is, is selling. And so then that's when and the British, you know, they're cool with it because it's their merchants are getting rich. Yeah. Gibraltar's tack, you know, tobacco importers, um, you know, they import as much tobacco in a year as Germany does. And it's not because the town of 15,000 people smokes more than the entire, <laughs> than all of Germany. It's because they're selling it on to the Spaniards. And so, um, you know, uh, and, and they would, you know, put it into, they'd roll it. I mean, they're like a quarter of the population of Gibraltar are cigarette rollers. You know, they, 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 they'll roll and then the, then the, Span the Spanish workers who come in and they have a job like in a, you know, and construction site or something and they make a decent wage, but they also wear a big overcoat uh, to work so that when they come home back to Spain in the evening, they can sort of stuff it with, um, with cigarettes and, you know, sell those. And, and then there were bigger operations as well, but it's certainly, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's this, the association of oversized clothing and criminality is one that goes back um, because it's, it's, it's uh, a good way to smuggle. Yeah, exactly. And to hide, you know, and to hide weapons and so forth. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think another thing I just want to talk about is that, like, um, I think one thing that's kind of interesting is when people think of, I'll just kind of go back to the point I made, is that, like, you know, borders are not, like, just a boundary and that's it. It allows for, like, there's nothing that occurs in that area. There's actually, like, lots of kind of cultural exchange. There's lots of kind of transportation between each uh, one side of the border and the other side of the border. Like, there's actually a lot going on there. So I think one the thing point you kind of define not only this board but maybe other borders as well. You um, talk about how you know the region's borders in terms of like Gibraltar, Moroccan region. The region's many borders, including seaports, become key sites of negotiation and the regional dialect of territoriality and mobility. For this reason, borders serve as a crucial starting point to gain appreciation for the region's complex political geography. Although they do not all serve an identical purpose, borders tend to draw from a common repertoire of practices and relationships relating related to regulating limits, territorial, but also jurisdictional, ethno-religious, or otherwise. They defined who could operate where, they could be tools of safecraft and tools for private individuals trying to escape the reach of state power. Which is I think and also that part of that you have to talk about how like local people actually have as much to affect what happens on the border than let's say the capitals in each of their responsive countries, right? That's kind of one of the main things you're trying to drive home with the way yeah. in which borders are created and yeah, possible. yeah, yeah, right. I mean, Madrid couldn't control neither, you know, neither could the, the Sultan's court in Morocco couldn't really control, and yet that's where all the action was. Um, when you had uh, for example, the French colony of Algeria uh, was starved for workers, right? Um they were trying to colonize the land. First, they needed soldiers to defeat the the the, the Kabyle rebels, um, the the Kabyle resistors uh, in Algeria, and then they needed um, workers, you know, people to 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 work on the agricultural settlements. Um, both Spain and Moroccan governments actually prohibited their um, their their um, their citizens from or their subjects from working in Algeria. Um, but they, 
really couldn't do anything to stop them from going there. Uh, and so it would be, Algeria became a place where Spaniards and Moroccans who wanted to avoid military service, who wanted to avoid debt, you know, avoid paying, you know, if they, if they were in trouble with debt, um, they could just go to Algeria, they could work, uh, they could make money, and they could avoid their obligations to the, to the states that they were leaving. Um, and the French um, just sort of, they, they just um, kind of, Come on in. <laughs> yeah, they didn't really. I mean, these and often, you know, if they, you know, if they would arrive at like a, an official processing center, they may be turned away. But they just the, the ships just drop them off on the shore somewhere and they just kind of go in. So they might be there for years and without being discovered. And then the French just kind of had to had to give them French nationality. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, these people, um, a lot of them became the famous Pied Noir, who a hundred years later were, you know, were, were, were expelled. Uh, most of them weren't French. They were originally of Spanish, uh, uh, about, well, about half of them were actually of Spanish descent uh, because they had come, you know, from Andalusia, from the sort of poor, poorer Southern Spain. And a lot of Moroccans came in to work um, as well. And so, um, uh, you know, I gave the example of Gibraltar with tobacco, uh, what's another example? How how the the, the Spanish enclaves in in northern Morocco, Ceuta and Melilla, would would provide um, would provide uh, shelter for um, uh, for Moroccan warlords um, who were pro German during World War One, um, who were trying to defeat the French, or at least you know um, at least tie down the French army in Morocco. Um, to prevent, you know, to sort of force them to have to keep a lot of soldiers in, in Morocco that couldn't then be deployed um, in, in continental Europe. So, so the Germans were very active in, in trying to get, um, in trying to like, just cause stir up trouble in, in Morocco. And so they, you know, they, they had all these um, Moroccan kind of, I use the term warlord, I think it's about the right term, these kind of militiamen leaders um, who, who had, you um, you know, kind of noble status um, and they had them on their payroll and they needed the Spanish to like give them shelter. And when they were in Ceuta and Melilla, they were sort of safe. They, they were safe from, from prosecution by the French um, because Spain was technically neutral, but the Spanish army was very pro-German. Uh, and so they would, so, so it just, all of these are to give examples of how, you know, borders sort of define what's possible on the other side in a way. Um, even, uh, you know, um, when you have the possibility to hide behind a border or to do an activity behind a border that's illegal on the other side of the border, then, you, you know, all you need to do is figure out how to get across it. And that's much easier often because borders can never be perfectly, um, you know, uh, perfectly sealed or yeah. they take a, a tremendous amount of effort. Um, which states usually just don't want to dedicate because it's it's impossible or it's so costly. Yeah, it's kind of also trying to find, you know, what's your space and what can happen in that space. And I think what Spain tries to do is it tries to kind of, I think unlike Britain and France, and it kind of gets to the second kind of point, like unlike Britain and France, how they kind of had like their border set, like their kind of, their area was kind of like, they can kind of define what goes in, what goes out, but with Spain, you know, that's really hard for them because you really just have like this area where both all these three countries are both kind of jostling for kind of position. And I think what Spain tries to, I think you brought it up at the, at the point of it was that like, um, this kind of goes into the second uh, theme, which is kind of like a new kind of take on imperialism, I think, or a different take, I think. And I think with Spain, I think you talk at one point, I think it's on page 67, how Spain was was not trying to, you know, get involved in Morocco or trying to get involved in these wars, not because it wanted to, I think you quote that says, um, try to uh, and get a seat at the colonial banquet. Um, rather, they're trying to kind of cultivate um, vassals to help save, to help resist Anglo and French pressures. And let me, right. just, let me get one point here real quick. And, um, and I have this just kind of get to the point of kind of like this, this new take on imperialism. You talk about how rather than tell a story of Europe pushing its way southward into Africa, this chapter posits the crystallization of a new locus of power 
centered on the maritime corridor. Power accumulated in these outposts precisely because of the remoteness from the older centers of political and economic power in West Central Morocco and Northern Spain, and simultaneously their links to the wider world via the Mediterranean corridor. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, that's a, a good example since we were talking about um, epidemics and contagion earlier. Um, a good example of that is how, um, you know, it's these, it's these um, outposts on the coast, Tangier, um, Ceuta Melilla, Oran, which is uh, sort of second largest city in French Algeria, Gibraltar. Um, these are small towns, really. They, there's not a lot of political power there, except that, like, the Sultan doesn't want Europeans real close to him. He wants to keep them at arm le arm's length. So he tells them they can settle in Tangier. And Tangier, well, the thing is, the European um, consuls, the representatives there, um, they're connected via, you know, a very good mail service. Morocco's mail service is terrible. It's a mountainous country with very poor interior transportation, but they have a mail service across the Mediterranean where very quickly you can get information from what's going on all the way on the other side of the Mediterranean. You can, especially you can learn about what? About this, about cholera outbreaks. And so the Europeans control a very important bit of knowledge, which is the spread of cholera. Well, Muslims, Moroccan Muslims uh, take pilgrimages um, to the holy sites, that famous Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, and they're coming back and bringing cholera, you know, to the Western Mediterranean with them. And um, the Sultan is, becomes desperate because, you know, his kingdom is, is, is becoming, you know, ravaged by cholera. And this is very early on. It's before really they know how to, you know, control it. Um, and so he kind of comes to the Europeans and he says, look, you, you know, I need your help. And he grants them the power to essentially prevent or give the green light or the red light from Muslim pilgrims being able to take the pilgrimage. And you can imagine the significance of that when Christians are telling a group of Muslim pilgrims, nope, you can't go. There's a cholera outbreak. Or if you go, you can't come back. Um, you know, if you think it's bad enough that, um, you know, the eggheads at the CDC are telling Americans that they have to wear masks, imagine Christian powers telling, um, you know, Muslim pilgrims that they can't go on their pilgrimage, even though this is one of the, you know, the five pillars of their religion. Um, and that moreover, their own Sultan has granted them this power. Um, and so that's, a, I think, a good example of how, you know, this kind of the outposts along this corridor, because they're linked into these networks of maritime communication, which at the time is much better than overland communication. Actually, a, a lot of power accrues to them, even though they're sort of small outposts that don't have necessarily a lot of like financial power, or military power or anything like that. Mm hmm. And also, I think another thing you kind of talk about with this is that I think you kind of brought it up is like, I'm not sure you can kind of tell me um, about this, but I think in this space, it's I, when people think about imperialism, it's about, you know, Europeans come in, they take control of the land, they can take control of everything. And it's everything the European, it's the Europeans way or the, you know, or no way at all. But in this space, it's really different because it's instead of them, unless maybe, maybe like Algiers, maybe a little bit different, but in specifically Morocco, it's more like, they kind of the Spanish kind of come in and they kind of kind of work with Moroccans and kind of like try to get what they want, but also Moroccans try to kind of get what they want. There's a bunch of characters you talk about who try to take advantage of the Spanish and try to kind of do their own way. Uh, I think the one person I thought was interesting was um, shoot, I wrote his name. Where is he at? Uh, Ra Ray, Ray Sunni, I think his name Ray is. Sunni, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so can you talk about that? Is that like something that's like um. Is that kind of the story of imperialism or is that something that's unique that happened in this area, do you think? Uh, well, it's not, no, it's, 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 this is a kind of a universal phenomenon. And it's one thing you brought up earlier that I want to, I, I, I had a chapter I called slipstream potentates. Mm -hmm. um, and who are these people? I mean, it's kind of a, a goofy term, but I thought it was appropriate. Um, these are people who like, when you have great powers having these rivalries, 
it creates a kind of space for these people to to kind of their you can call them political entrepreneurs they raise their own militias and they kind of have their own <clears throat> almost sovereign power in a way over certain places and certain routes um you know they're essentially bandits you can call them bandits you can call them warlords you can call them you know wh whatever you want but they um they are people who kind of just take advantage of, of the situation. They took advantage, uh, for example, the fact uh, that, you know, Raisuni kind of starts kidnapping Europeans and getting ransoms and he makes money from, sell, you know, from, from ransom money. And then he uses that money to build a militia. And eventually um, he takes over um, in, in Tangier, he, uh, which is, you know, booming city by the, by, by um, 19... 04 is when he, you know, he, he essentially negotiates, he takes a, a British journalist uh, as captive and he negotiates the return. You know, he says, in return, I want the Sultan to make me the, you know, to essentially give me control of Tangier, which he does. And so for two years, he controls the city of Tangier and he taxes, you know, he makes this as a tremendous money taxing the Europeans, who, the settlers there who don't really know, they don't care who, who the, their money goes to. And he sort of leaves them alone. You know, he doesn't really, he's not violent to them. Now he's violent to the other, uh, uh, you know, the people of the rival gang. And so Europeans start to become, the settlers start to become a little squeamish because they see the heads of <clears throat> Raisuni's rival gang on pikes and things. And they, you know, like, I don't know if I want to settle here. Um, and eventually they kick him out, but he's become extremely wealthy at this point. During World War I, he makes alliances with the Spanish and then the Germans and then, you know, and then the French. And he's always moving back and forth, switching his alliances and building up power. And so nothing gets done in northern Morocco without sort of uh, forming an alliance with Raisuni. And eventually they finally catch him. Uh, when he's an old man, he's about 50. Um, but mean, in the meantime, he's become, you know, he's become really a legend, a kind of, you know, and of course, there's people like this. I mean, you know, Pancho Villa uh, may, may sort of uh, fit this. Um, and there's a lot of it, these in Spain. I talk about a guy named Juan March, who's a tobacco smuggler, you know, and, you know, and he builds a network of people. He's got, you know, something like 40,000 people on his payroll. And a lot of them are Spanish officials. And he sells intelligence to the British because he's got so many ships out at sea that are tobacco smuggling ships. But they observe the movements of the German U-boats. They sell that information to the British. Meanwhile, um, they he buys you know um, vessels that can store petroleum. So they sell um, uh, actually not I'm sorry uh, uh, coal. And so they sell coal to the German. Uh, Navy, you know, in the meantime, and he's making, he's just getting rich off World War I. I mean, he's already rich, uh, but yeah. he's just becoming, and he winds up, you know, um, he winds up uh, going into politics after that, and, and he's the one who bankrolls the um, uh, Franco's uh, military revolt of 1936. So um, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, there, there are these people everywhere, but I think one of the points I want to make is when you have a lot of a density of, of different um, great powers that are all kind of struggling with each other, it, it kind of opens a space for these very entrepreneurial warlords to, to make, to sort of do all kinds of double dealing and build their, build themselves um, and build their entourages into something that to forces to be contended with. Um, so, so it's not like this is the only place in the world it happens, but it's ripe for that kind of thing. I see. I see. Uh, and Dan, do you have any thoughts or questions you, you kind of had, um, kind of listen to Packer or anything like that? So just a quick comment on the, uh, the port of Gibraltar and the, the, the U S sixth fleet that is stationed there. Mm. Or stationed area. So. Yeah. That was it. You were you were questioning fifth or sixth. It, it, you confirmed it's the sixth. Okay, yeah, that's what I <laughs> thought. But then I, I suddenly had a, had a doubt and I couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I guess the Thanks kind of for that. yeah, thank you, Dan. So um, mm -hmm. kind of because uh, I think one thing that kind of talks about you know borders and I think we talked about it earlier is that like 
Um, we talked about earlier how like this is not really like a national history is very national Morocco, but I think this kind of borderland kind of impacts what occurs in those countries. I think is one thing you can talk about. If we're to go to like to Spain specifically, right? Like as the 1920s and after the First World War ended, kind of there's a lot of calls for like Moroccan independence and stuff like that. You have people who are doing these type of movements, not only in this area, but I think across the world in a sense, but in Morocco it happens. And that kind of leads to like the Rift War, like the very famous 19, early 1920s conflict that occurs there. And I think you talk about how like that conflict kind of leads to at least, I forget which Spanish government falls kind of in the like the midst of all of that, but basically that, what to do with what's going on there and if to actually go in there, take it over or not, it's kind of one of the reasons for the Spanish government to fall and change. But then in the 1930s, yeah. you have, uh, I, that same similar area, you know, lead to the Spanish Civil War. So can you kind of talk about how these kind of borderlands end up impacting like their native countries? So I guess I guess we can stay with Spain. Maybe you can touch on Morocco, too, in itself, kind of like that area. I don't know. And, that, and, is- and yeah, sure. I mean, you know, this again, it's not something that has to be uh, relative, related to a border, but I think it, there's something specifically powerful about that. What happens is, is that um, the, the, there's a, um, the, the Spanish, uh, you know, have, have been awarded this sliver of Northern Morocco as a colony, as a kind of, um, the, most of Morocco is a French colony, but the, but the British don't want France to control the territory all the way up to the Strait of Gibraltar, because the Strait of Gibraltar is a British zone. So the, the idea is that Spain forms this kind of buffer. And so it works out for everyone. This is what this is the reason that France and Britain are able to be allies in World War One. It's because the Spanish buffer of northern Morocco has taken away a potential area of conflict between Britain and France. So it enables them to form an alliance, which in, in 1904, which then is the Entente of World War One. But in the meantime, uh, so the Spanish, you know, are happy to have a colony, or at least some Span, you know, some of the Spanish government are happy to have a colony, um, but they don't really want to do anything with it because, you know, they don't want to invest, you know, they, they don't really want to conquer it. Um, they, they know it's not a really wealthy territory. There's not a lot of, you know, not ra- national resource, natural resources. There's not a lot. So they, they're just happy to kind of have it be a colony on paper, but not really try to occupy it. Um but then uh, what ha- starts to happen in, in World War I, the Germans want to use it, as I was saying before, to try to needle the French. Um, and <clears throat> the Spanish are sort of, you know, there's a lot of anti-French sentiment in the Spanish army, so the Spanish sort of abet that. Um, and then the French are mad that the Spanish were kind of helping the Germans during World War I, even though they're supposed to be neutral. And so after... Um, the war is over, the French say, well, we're going to just find a way to take over all of Morocco. That's, you know, that's sort of their goal. And the Spanish say, "Uh oh, we better, the French are going to try to take our colony. So we better try to occupy it seriously. Um, So they don't have the excuse of saying, well, the Spanish aren't really there. They're just sort of there on paper. Um, And, and so in doing that, they I mean, I should say there are iron mines um, that are quite lucrative there, but they're very close to the coast. So you can occupy the iron mines without really occupying the whole colony. Um, It's just a small little area. Uh, And and so like, but at that point, the Spanish say, well, no, we're going to, so they really go in and try to occupy the place. And that um, sort of triggers a resistance that becomes um, the Rift War, um, which this, which, as you say, like it, it, there's a disaster which like 8,000 Spaniards are killed, Spanish soldiers are, are killed um, in an ambush at a place called Anual in 1921. Um, the Spanish democratic government falls two years later and the king installs a dictator, a military dictator who eventually um, does manage kind of to, to win, to defeat the Riffies um, with the help of the French um, by 1926, but it's really the end of the, lib- like then the monarchy falls after that because people are, you know, kind of mad at the king because he installed a dictator. Um, and then that sort of destabilizes Spanish politics to the, to the point where they head towards civil war. So, um, 
you know, so, so that's, you know, one way where, you know, you really see, I think how this can boomerang back, um, you know, this kind of colonialism can, can, can boomerang back and it's not, um, and, you know, this is not some abstract colony far away. It's a, a colony that's right on its border. And the reason that the Spanish are so doggedly defending it is not, be, like I say, it's not really because they want this colony. It's because they don't want France to push in and be essentially surrounding them. Um, and so it's, a, it's, again, it's sort of a geopolitical concern rather than a, like a colonial concern, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think also something similar happens in Algeria with France, because I believe after the Algerian war, isn't there a plot to kind of overthrow the government? Absolutely. Is- and, and that's that's a great um, that's a great point that the the, the um, and I just wrote an article about this. It hasn't been published yet, but, um, you know, kind of comparing these two scenarios, what you have in um, in Algeria, the, the French, you know, have this war in Algeria. Uh, in the in 1954, and it goes on and on, and finally they bring in, or you know, De Gaulle, who's you know he doesn't become a dictator exactly, but he be, is a kind of strong man like Primo de Rivera was, at, you know, in in Spain, and he and he's able, he has this sort of the charisma um, to kind of lead the country through the crisis, but ultimately he can't dictate dictate the terms. The terms are dictated by um, a greater power which is the United States by then, just like for Spain, the terms, Primo would have been happy to withdraw. The Spanish government would have been happy to withdraw from Morocco, but this French won't let it because the French are so determined um, to keep, you know, to, to essentially keep the colonial system intact. French argue that, look, if, you know, if there is a rebellion here and the Rifis gain independence, there's going to be a sort of domino effect and the entire Muslim world will be in revolt against European colonialism. So they really insist that the Spanish, you know, fight to keep to keep the colony. In the French case, it's sort of the opposite. It's sort of like if um, uh, the United States says, yeah, you know what, if the if if the. Um, you guys keep fighting well, then the, you know, the Muslim world will, you know, ally with the Soviet Union, um, you know, because it's the height of the Cold War. So in, in, in neither case, you know, they both were sort of constrained by the greater power. Um, and then in the end, what happens is, uh, it, you know, it, it kind of bifurcates the right, the political right in both countries. And, and in, in Spain, you have the, the political right, um, you know, those who kind of want to work within the Anglo-French colonial system, and then the Francoists who say, you know, that was, that's a mistake, what we need to align ourselves with the Germans and the Italians and like, you know, defeat the French and and British Empire. And that sort of becomes this kind of conflict on the right, that's part of the Spanish Civil War. And the French, um, you know, you see that simmering too over decades, even though ultimately there's no civil war in France, um, the, the, the Gaullist right, that is the, the, the kind of conservative party that was founded by Charles de Gaulle and kind of continued on and was the kind of the mainstream conservative party until a few years ago, now is almost nothing. And the party that issues from the pro, uh, you know, the people who wanted to fight to keep Algeria, I mean, who was one of the, one of the most, um, important, um, advocates of keeping Algeria, fighting to the death for Algeria, was a man named uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, who was a young oh. politician. And of course, he founded the, 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 the party that became the National Front. Uh, now his daughter runs that front. And that's the main party of the French right today. Um, and, and so, you know, there, it, it, it's sort of interesting to see how in both cases, these colonial wars even though you have a kind of a military strong man who kind of guides the country through and to resolution, it creates this undercurrent. And in the Spanish case, it led directly to the civil war in 1936. In the French case, it took a long time because it, it was a more stable democracy. It was a different era, but you see these kind of two versions of the conservative right uh, and one, the Gaullist right is dominant for a while, but it's really gone down. And the, and the kind of pro-Algeria right or the pro, um, 
you know, imperialist right uh, is now on the ascendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just kind of get to the last theme. I just kind of want to end this conversation by, you know, by then going to the, the, the last part of the theme that I have. Yeah. Um, so um, I know one thing you do is you kind of go all the way into World War II, I believe. Um, how does like the end of the Second World War kind of, I don't think it really changes. I don't think it ends kind of, I guess, impair them, but it definitely does evolve kind of how the European powers, I mean, especially the United States kind of interact with this part of the world. How does that, how does that event kind of change what occurs in that area? Does it, is it a full like end or does it kind of evolve what occurs in that area? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's gradual, um, you know, all like the decolonization, the United States, you know, kind of promises Morocco independence during the war because they want to um, use the Morocco as a staging ground to, to, to um, land in North Africa. You know, you saw Casablanca, a great movie. Um, and they, they want to get, um, you know, eventually use that as a launching point to invade Europe, um, which is kind of how it plays out. Um, and so they make some promises, but then, and, and they eventually keep them in 1956, the Americans broker Moroccan independence. But I think more than that, um, it's, it's a period when um, a lot of the mixing that's taken place, like, I mean, there's such a, a rich kaleidoscope of cultures and languages and it's something I haven't you know it's a big theme in the book that I haven't really I've been talking a lot about you know the geopolitics and so forth but there's this rich tapestry of religions there's 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 um a, a, a very a, a large presence of, of Judaism in North Africa of um of course Islam and then there's all these European peoples who settle there French Germans um, British uh, Spaniards, of course, of, and, and, and I get a lot into the, the kind of the, the, um, the relationship of these people and of, of all these different peoples. And, you know, the, the Spaniards tend to, uh, the Spaniards tend to be working class, the people who kind of settle in this region, because they're going there for, for work, because it's kind of a boom, a boom zone, a lot of building and construction and so forth. The Moroccans too, who kind of migrate up there from rural areas of Morocco tend to be sort of more working people. And the Spaniards and the Moroccans are off, often like live in the same neighborhoods. They're very, um, they can be very intimate uh, with each other. I mean, there's a lot of cases of, you know, love and girlfriends and boyfriends, less so marriage, because there's still a lot of institutional barriers to marriages between Christians and Muslims. But there's a lot of friendships, a lot of um, romantic relationships, wet nursing, you know, these kinds of things that you wouldn't find, um, you know, the British or French doing because they tended to be more sort of upper class settlers or at least middle class and they, not upper class so much, but middle class. Uh, and they kind of kept to themselves in enclaves more. Um, but the point is that overall you get this sort of, um, this, this very interesting mix of people um, which where, where there's a lot of tensions, but there's also a lot of exchange um, and generally peaceable kind of living. And then with decolonization, that all ends. And you have this kind of resegregation, a sorting where the, this, the Europeans all have to leave. Um, the Jews, uh, you know, who've been in Morocco. Well, some Jews have been in Morocco for a really long time. Um, I mean, there, there's a settlements of Jews from the, say from the you know almost i guess byzantine times i'm not really sure sixth or seventh century um but then the main influx of jews comes in the 15th century when they're expelled from from catholic spain they're, they've been there a long time and then suddenly you know with the creation of israel there's a lot of kind of anti-semitism on the rise in the arab world including morocco so i mean the jews pretty much take off for the u.s canada Argentina, Israel. Um, and so from between like into Moroccan independence in 1956 and like within five years, there's very few Jews left. There's like 7,000. There had been like a quarter million. Now suddenly there's 7,000 left, uh, you know, within five years. So there's this massive kind of demographic sorting, which, you know, is maybe just an inevitable product of anti-colonial nationalism, of um, you know the, what the post-war world brought, but 
you know, it, it is, it's also kind of sad in a way when you read about um, cities like Tangier that just seems like they were just buzzing, fascinating places. You know, I mean, Beirut is another one, another one of these cities that, you know, was just such a, a mix of cultures and, you know, and, and, and kind of this place of dynamic exchange, uh, cultural exchange and so forth. And, and, and like, then they had their civil war and now I, from, I've never been there before what I understand, you know, you have like four cities, Beirut is just like totally segregated and you just don't have that same feel used to be the Paris of the East, they'd call it. And now, you know, it's, it's just not like that anymore. And, and uh, so anyway, the point is that, you know, you can kind of lament that even though you don't necessarily lament the, the end of European imperialism and all that, you sort of, there, there was this aspect to it, um, which, which has sort of been lost, I think. Um, or maybe, maybe it's just been reproduced. Now we see it more in Paris or in London and places where people now migrate, um, you know, then we actually see it down in, in those places, which have become much more homogeneous. Yeah. I could definitely see this, this kind of cost cultural kind of occurrence tech having, especially when you describe tourism that occurred in the 19th century. And uh, like, it's funny. I looked at a picture of Tangiers, <laughs> like, wow, it looks like a Mediterranean city, like a European Mediterranean city. Sure. But um, yeah, that was the, the part in tourism I thought was interesting. Um, but yeah, so a lot of good stuff there. So uh, kind of get the last kind of point in the book. Uh, one thing I kind of felt is kind of like this very long, uh, kind of long debate form that you kind of take for history. Um, I know I want to talk about like how you kind of dealt with that and kind of like how do historians kind of like what's their views on it. So I know like when uh, people look at you know long forms of history instead of like maybe like a short, you know, a decade or something like that, people say if you go long, a lot of times you can kind of like miss a lot of details or stuff like that. Well, if people who kind of look at a shorter period of time, they say that, you know, you look at, um, you lose a lot of context of what's going on through here. So I guess the question is, why did you kind of decide to kind of write this book from like, a, you know, from the beginning of the, you kind of start late 18th century and go all the way into like almost the modern period. Kind of what was your decision to, to do it that way? Why did you feel that was a proper way? And then um, kind of how do you just deal with the amount of information and to kind of keep it consistent there? Because I've been doing a little bit of that and yeah. it was hard for me but i'm like how did you kind it, of yeah yeah no it's look i mean it's a fairly constrained physical area so that helps i mean obviously you know if you're trying to write the history of you know uh spain or morocco for that matter you know over a 200 year period you know you're going to miss a lot of detail but it, it's a fa fairly <clears throat> limited geographical area so it wasn't so bad um but i i think you know, it's a different kind of perspective. I wanted to show how uh, I, I thought in the middle of the 19th century, a lot of things were happening. You have the advent of much faster transportation, like steam powered um, transportation. You have um, uh, uh, this kind of emphasis on territory in governance and territorial control, as I said, geopolitics. Um, uh, you have, you know, so there's, there's just a, a lot of sort of things going on in the mid 19th century that I thought were, were, were a good starting point. Um, and, and the, the great historian Charles Mayer pointed out um, in a wonderful essay that like, if you look at the 19th century and the 20th century as sort of blocks of time, you get one, you get specific narratives of 19th century. If it goes from the French revolution to world war one, you have this kind of narrative of like the bourgeois revolution and, you know, and then the rise of the working classes and the industrial revolution. And it kind of culminates in world war one. And then 1914 to 1991 is this other narrative. And, and it's hard to break free from that. If you keep using those same markers as front, you know, bookends of your thinking, it's hard to break free from that, but it's sort of artificial at the same time. And he proposes looking at like 1860 to 1970, which is approximately what I did in this, um, give or take. I mean, it's really more 1850, but, you know, this kind of, and, and you think, well, why is that? And he sort of says, well, because 1860 is when you have all these unifications, Italian, Germany, American Civil War, the Japanese, you know, he says like, there's this emphasis on territory, uh, that arises in the middle of the 19th century. And by the 19, by 1970, he says, this is sort of fragmented and breaks apart. Um, and like the state and the nation start to lose their saliency. 
And so you get a more kind of structural narrative rather than a moral narrative. Mm. If that, you know, that's kind of, I mean, you, you know, I don't want to elaborate on that too much, but, but you, you get a different type of narrative if you just choose different beginning and end points. And so I thought that for, for a, a thing about borders, like structures are more important than politics. And so I, then, you know, then, then, um, idiot, let's say structures are more important than ideologies. Mm. Um, and so, um, and so this is really more a book about, um, you know, about, about these kind of structures and mobility and interactions rather than, you know, than ideologies and movements. Yeah. Like nationalism or yeah. anything like that. Yeah. I yeah. see what you're saying. Um, so, yeah. Um, so kind of talking, I'm kind of my last kind of talk about this kind of like, um, when we talk about borders and stuff like that, I know that there's one word in particular that Americans are particularly kind of interested in, especially recently, is kind of like the U.S. border with Mexico. And I think one point that I feel kind of connects your book, or at least one lesson I feel connects the book you just wrote and kind of what's going on there, is kind of this idea that like people think that like the U.S.-Mexican border is like this natural endpoint for like American kind of control and kind of like that's kind of like you know, Americans must control it. And it's always been like that thing that always been there. But in reality, the U.S. border, Mexican border hasn't always been like this naturalized border in any case. Because um, one thing we were yeah, it's Dan- a fixed right around that same point in the middle of the 19th century. Right. With I mean, that's when it becomes what it is today. Yeah, I was about to say, because one thing we found out is that the U.S. Border Patrol wasn't created until 1924. And the first border fence wasn't actually built to like 1909, 1911. And uh, like, yeah, the Mexicans, uh, Mexican American war was like 1840, I believe. So can you kind of talk about like, uh, like that comparison of like how borders are kind of like developed and stuff like that? I don't know if, if you yeah, had yeah, the timing is, is similar. I mean, they're both sort of natural borders and since it's a river, uh, or it's a, you know, a maritime passageway in the cases. Um, but it's deceptively so because of course, you know, these are created in the middle of the 19th century, really. Um, and actually, that's interesting you say it because the, the, the Spanish case, you know, those walls and stuff start to be built around 1909, 1911. I don't remember the exact dates now, but it's right, right around then. It starts to be. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, you, there's this sort of obvious superficial point that, you know, you're talking about a very rich country uh, to the north and a very sort of poor country or region to the south. Um, and get that gets poorer the further south you go. Um, and so there's a sort of a natural migratory flux. Um, and it essentially puts um, the economy that is like the labor market, um, which would dictate, you know, people moving northward in both cases in conflict with identity. Um, this idea that the north, you know, needs to like nations need to maintain their identity. So even if they're open to immigration, um, they, they need to have some way to sort of control it so it doesn't overwhelm the, the people there and just cause too much confusion with, with, with identity, uh, with the nation's identity. So, so um, in that sense, you know, they are comparable. Um, but I, I guess, you know, the big difference has to be that um, with the, respect to the U.S. and Mexico, you don't have, I mean, you just you essentially have, uh, a couple of, of countries um, being involved with the, with the case of Spain and Morocco, they're sort of two weaker countries, which are both kind of colonies in a way, even though Spain's always independent, they're both sort of colonies of this greater imperial system mm-hmm. um, historically. And so I think that would be a, a you know, main difference from what you're gonna see with, um, you know, with the U.S. Mexico relationship, but certainly today there are a lot of similarities. You have um, um, Mexico and Morocco both gain a lot of leverage in negotiations with the Europeans or with the Americans because they sort of control the floodgates, if you want to put it that way. The Mexicans can sort of, you know, decide how many Central Americans will be permitted to sort of move forth and and kind of storm the border, um, which of course is this very powerful political image in the United States, and it's you know works pretty similarly in Europe. The Moroccans, you know, when they're not when they're in a conflict with Spain, you, just a couple of months ago there was this big uh, 
um, Russia, the border of a bunch of African uh, migrants who were trying to get in. And, and it was no coincidence that it happened right after Morocco and, Morocco and Spain had gotten involved in a diplomatic dispute. And the Moroccan border guard said, OK, well, we'll just op open things up. And suddenly all these people are rushing the border, leaving the Spanish who want to be humanitarian, but also don't want to let these people in in a real sticky bind. So, yeah. And I think also interesting is kind of like there's lots of like when we look at borders as well, I think the U.S. Mexican border is really interesting because like if you look at do you look at like southern United States near the border and also the other side of Mexico, it's like it looks kind of similar. There's like a lot of like similarities. I think if you even go to a place like, um, oh, what is it called? I forgot the city. Uh, fudge, my parents are going to kill me because they live there. But I know there's, <laughs> uh, where is it? I'll, I'll, for, I'll, I'll probably put it in, but I know like how there's some parts where like you look at, there's a lot of like cultural similarities between the two places on each side of the border. So it's kind of weird to say like, like the border is like natural, but you see there's lots of similarities, a lot of oh, cultural yeah. Oh, yeah. communication yeah, absolutely. that goes there. Yeah, um, no, that's that's absolutely right. There, there's, there's um, you know, uh, on the national level, they seem quite different. But as you get real close to it, I mean, French and British colonists would often point out they, they didn't really know the difference between the Spaniards and the Moroccans. And, uh, you know, they couldn't tell the difference. Um, they even spoke often the same language, which was sort of a mix of Spanish and and, and Berber and Arabic and stuff, you know, and, and I think that's probably true in largely in El Paso and places like that too, is that there's just, you know, on the local level, there's just a lot of hybridity that you don't, that you, that you lose if you just look at the, the national level. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So really just point there. So second point. So how did you get into history, especially like Spanish history and the history of movement, movement, uh, and, uh, yeah. So why'd you, why'd you, do, why'd you decide to do this job essentially? <laughs> well, it's not a bad job. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I started, I was interested in history. I was interested in American history. I did, I studied abroad in Madrid my junior year and that kind of converted me to um, Spanish history. I became so interested in it. And then, um, uh, you know, and then after that, I, I went, um, I, I, I I guess like being a, a student uh, abroad maybe made me realize um, just how the tourism industry was so important to Spain. And, and I never really thought about that before. I was, you know, a college kid and it just never really occurred to me how some country, I mean, it really was a major industry. Um, and, uh, and then I, um, when I, it just kind of left that idea in my back pocket. Uh, and then, you know, when I went on to, 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 I needed a topic for my PhD dissertation. I thought that that would be an interesting one to explore. Like, how did that happen? What are the consequences of it? And of course, the big sort of explosion in tourism took place during the dictatorship of Franco. Um, and, um, and so just the, the kind of dissonance of this kind of conservative authoritarian traditionalist dictator being the one who presides over this explosion of like tour European tourists who are mainly there to have fun, to lie on the beach, very sexual, um, you know, was, was kind of a, a clash, a, a, a contradiction that I wanted to learn more about. And that actually became the, my dissertation and then eventually my first book. Um, so, you know, how did I get into it? I don't know. I always like to write. I always like to, um, you know, I like probably anybody watching, I'm, interested in history <laughs> um just kind of naturally it's hard to explain really um if you either are or you aren't uh i guess and so so that that was really that but i never really you know thinking about having a career as a historian not um you know it kind of came in stages um i just i did other jobs when i was younger um and this was just the one that stuck so i you know applied to do a PhD and I got accepted, uh, you know, to study at the University of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I, if I hadn't found a job afterwards, I would have done something else. Uh, but I did find a job. So I took it. <laughs> <laughs> like it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so the kind of one last thing I want to talk about is kind of like I think we, we kind of started this conversation with Professor Harris, but I kind of want to continue this conversation about kind of like how Spanish 
history is kind of looked at in kind of the Anglo-American academia and kind of why people are not like there's not like a lot of importance put upon it um but especially like modern history but first i kind of want to read something i read from reading uh pamela radcliffe's modern spain 1808 into the present in her introduction she kind of brings this idea to light i think adding to spain's marginalization in the english language historiography is the historically weak presence of spanish history in u.s universities in 1970 only 13 of the 135 universities with graduate programs had a Spanish historian who could train students. By 2000, the number had risen to 37, but that still only represents one-fourth of the total. More broadly, only about 11% of U.S. undergraduate institutions have courses dedicated to Spanish history in their history department. Thus, most students in the United States still learn what, they, what little they do about Spain from survey courses whose textbooks either ignore or employ negative stereotypes in their treatment of Spain. Uh, and I think one of the things about modern Spanish history is that like, it's a state that's kind of like failed with its multiple like revolutions right. and it becomes a very weak power that I think in your point, you kind of know how it almost becomes like a colonial, like a uh, uh, target for Spain and Britain or, or sorry, or, sorry, France and Britain in their kind of ways. Um, and so but in my opinion, I think it's kind of different. I think in modern span, I think of course you study it. I think there's a lot of unique kind of um, attempt and uh, opportunities that can be learned about uh, other parts of you know what it means, the part of the human experience, especially about modern modern period. I think so. I guess the question that uh, I have is kind of um, let's go to my notes real quick. Um, do you do you agree that's kind of like why people don't really care about Spanish history? And um, then also, why should that change in a sense? And how, yeah, how I mean, I, just, I think that's right. It falls between two. No, it just falls between like on the one hand, it's um, uh, it's a it's a it's a European country, a kind of a colonial power, um, but it's not one of the important ones, especially in the modern period. But it's also not a colonized country where you can talk about um, the experience of decolonization and and of colonization and decolonization. So, so in, in that sense, I think it, you know, it just sort of doesn't really fit anyone's kind of template. Um, but, but, um, uh, but of course, you, you know, it's, it, it's just a fascinating country in its own right. It's the country of diverse landscapes that deals with, you know, um, a number of crises. Um, it has a different, you know, all kinds of different regions, different climatic zones, different um, uh, identities, um, regional identities that become national identities. I mean, there's so much there uh, uh, in the, you know, like you say, the human experience that um, I think it's just worth studying, um, even if it's a unique history, you know, every country is a unique history. So um, there's no particular reason why uh, Spain, you know, is less, is, is more unique or less unique than another country's history, but it's just, it, it doesn't, it, it lacks power and influence in the modern time, modern period that I think, you know, it, may, it makes people um, turn, you know, not necessarily focus on it, but, um, but when you get into it, just like anything else, it's just becomes worth studying because it's interesting and you, you can learn a lot about uh, a number of different areas with wider application it's just not so obvious i think to people what it is like in the way that the british empire might be real obvious yeah because i remember we were talking with professor downs uh in our last podcast he was talking about right. like, other parts and i think his his thing was like civil wars and like spain it's like a really interesting space to look at how civil wars develop well, and stuff like that as yeah well. sure yeah that's a gr- great example because they have so many of them between, <laughs> between um you know 1808 and, and 1939 exactly and then um what what do you think should kind of spanish historians or people who study spain do you think that we're doing enough or do you think what do you think is a strategy that can be used or to kind of change it do you think do you have any ideas on that or what's your thoughts on that well that's t- yeah that, that's a tough one um you know i think um uh, I think it's tough even for European history uh, in general. I mean, it has to sort of compete more with other, I mean, in terms of, if you want to think of it that way, it's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing that uh, we're, we're open to studying many more parts of the world as historians than we used to be, um, or there's more interest in many different parts of the world. I do think Europe, especially since most history that's taught is modern history, you know, from 1500, say, to the present, 
Europe is, um, you know, a, a disproportionately influential place. So it probably, you know, merits closer study uh, than, than some other places, but that doesn't mean that it should have, you know, this, this like Line total share. dominance either. And I think, yeah. And I think that Spain, um, you know, is, is, I think, I think for Spanish historians, if we want to kind of stand out, I mean, one way is that Spain really is kind of does lie um, with one foot in Europe and one foot sort of out outside of Europe or as a different kind of, of place. And I think that that's what makes it such a unique history to study. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. I'll, I'll keep that in mind as I do my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I uh, before we go, the uh, comments on the, the Jewish people in Morocco, yeah. yeah. Uh, definitive evidence of them being there as early as 200 BCE. Oh, wow. And, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And there was a community of between 250,000 to 400,000 of them there the, during the period of from then until about 1950. And now there's less than 2,000. Yeah. Oh, less than 2,000. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, by, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it. So, Professor uh, Pack, thank you very much for coming on. I know you're very busy. You have a lot of things going on, but thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And... Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no Good problem. to meet you, Dan. Nice to meet yeah. you, too, sir. And everyone, Let me know how it yeah. goes. Yeah, and everyone, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We definitely have more on the way, so definitely stay tuned and take things out. But uh, peace out. We'll talk to you guys later. Hi, everyone. Eric here. If you enjoyed this podcast with Dr. Sasha Pack, then be sure to check out the quick fire Q&A video we did with them. The video will be coming out soon, so be sure to click the subscribe button and hit the bell notification and like the video to stay up to date on all things History Made Awesome. Thank you.